This morning we're bringing you exclusive coverage of Salem Season 2, which premieres this Sunday on our sister station, WGN America. With the first season in the books, one question remains unanswered. How did they do it? How did they take these stories of witchcraft and satanic rituals and turn it all into a hit show? Well, according to everyone involved, it hasn't been easy, but it's certainly been fun. Okay, it's set. Action! There's a lot that goes into creating a show like Salem. The biggest challenge is that, that the scripts are often filled with things that no one's done before. It's not a simple process, but it can be rewarding. Rather than challenges, when you're directing a show like this, it's opportunities. To be able to do a period piece like this and add in all this horror and thriller, also blended with, with actors of incredible uh, quality, it's just a fantastic opportunity as a director. And the stars of the show agree. We're so lucky to have so many wonderful people working on this. They create the world for you, and then you just kind of play in it. You return, and you're back in Salem, mm -hmm. and you're back in the wardrobe, and back in the yeah. world, and it really is immersive. It's hard not to have fun on, in a project like this. In fact, some of the cast has a little too much fun, staying in character even when they don't need to. We should tell you that Salem is for mature audiences. In fact, many scenes take place here at the Divining Rod. This is the local brothel, and there's some of the workers now. Hi, ladies. Hello. How's it going? It's going great. <laughs> Thank goodness everyone has a good sense of humor, considering the content of the show is far from funny. They're such nice people. How do they write this? They're demented material. This. These situations are absolutely horrifying. But even when shooting the most serious scenes, the cast and crew are excited about the work they're doing, both on screen and behind the cameras. It's just that magic that every everybody just wants to make, and so you feel inspired to keep at it. I mean, the cast genuinely loves each other. We're all in Shreveport together. Very few people actually live here and go home to their families. So we are one another's family. Yeah. Salem Season 2 begins tomorrow night at 9 on WGN America. If you missed any of our special reports this week, you'll find them all on our website. We're here in the studio of Hot Mix 101.9, joined by Jay Steele, who gets your tunes on the radio every day. And we're getting people excited about the Grammys coming yeah. up tonight. Um, we know we've got some big hitters involved, obviously. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the people who are looking to walk away with some big prizes this year? Uh, Kendrick Lamar has the most nominations. He's a hip hop R&B guy. Uh, not everybody's familiar with, but he's been around for a little bit. He's actually got 11 nominations this year, so look for him to, to leave with a bunch of hardware. Uh, Taylor Swift, which, you know, now she's a household name, she's tied with The Weeknd with seven nominations. So I expect all three of them to walk away with multiple trophies tonight. I'd, I'd be surprised if they didn't. A lot of big performers hitting the stage tonight. Who's on that lineup for uh, the performance is Taylor Swift kicking things off, right? Taylor Swift, we think, is going to open the show, and uh, it, it doesn't get much bigger than Taylor Swift these days. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that should be exciting. You don't you don't want to tune in five minutes late. We'll put it that way. It's very pop heavy. Uh, Adele is going to be performing, even though she's not nominated. Uh, Rihanna, Justin Bieber, all the big names from the pop world on the country side of things. A little Big Town, uh, Carrie Underwood will be performing. Lady Gaga is actually doing a, a special David Bowie tribute. Which, oh yeah, which would be kind of cool. If you had to make a prediction of who might walk away with the most awards tonight. Obviously, you've got Best New Entertainer, Album of the Year. Who do you think right. is going to take top honors tonight? Well, you got the big four. I think there's like 80-some categories, but the big four would be Album of the Year, Song of the Year, Record of the Year, and Best New Artist. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say Kendrick Lamar's album probably will win Album of the Year if I had to make a prediction on that. Uh, song of the Year, Taylor Swift has a lot of respect as a songwriter. Uh, I really think she's probably going to win Song of the Year with Blank Space. Uh, I'm going with Mark Ronson and Bruno Mars of Tom Funk. That was such a big song all year as a uh, record of the year. And Best New Artist, uh, someone who's been around for most of the year, Megan Trainer. I think. Is, oh, yeah. yeah I, I think uh, All About That Bass was a big song. And it, maybe with her it was all about timing, uh, but she did have some big hits this year. So I, I really think she's going to do well. All right. Uh, thanks for talking to us. This is Jay no Steele, Hot Mix 101.9. You can hear him After every news, day. 2 to 7. Monday through Friday. Two to seven. Yep. Tune in. And make sure you watch the Grammys tonight right here on CBS. I'm here right now with Gilgamesh Taggett playing Daddy Warbucks in Annie. 
at the Walton Art Center. Thanks for being here with us. Pleasure to be here. My first question is, um, how's it been on the road right now? A lot of traveling for you guys, right? It's always traveling, but uh, uh, that's the fun part of it for me. Uh, but I sleep in a vehicle well, so I suppose that helps. Uh, we, we travel, we've traveled all over the country, far east, far west, far north. Uh, uh, we're talking about possibly Alaska in a future, oh, wow. a future tour. So we may, we may hit uh, all the 50 states with this tour. Arkansas right now, two more performances today and then... And then one on Sunday. And then one on Sunday. There's been quite a few versions of Annie. There's, uh, sure. I think, a film from the, the 80s. 1984. Yeah. 84, and then, you know, another one maybe in the 90s. Well, then, of course, it's been done in community theaters uh, across the board. And then... It is done every day, every hour of the day, somewhere around the world. Really? Yeah. Wow. I found that out during last year's tour, and... and did the math on it and it's it's possible there's the uk tour going on sure. there's the australian tour there's and then every community theater possible worldwide so in every time zone at some point or another annie's being performed you've gone from the 80s to the 90s now and then there was a a really modernized version of it just within the past couple of years yeah it was l last year i think last yeah. year that's the new version for mm -hmm. the for the modern day but the version that is at the walton arts center what you're involved with is more for the everyday the director is Martin Sharnan, mm -hmm. who was the original director who put it on Broadway in 1977. Uh, he was the brain, uh, brain behind the project. Martin was the, the visionary who wanted to take this story and put it on, on the stage. So he's taken the show back to its, its original heart and roots, uh, but not uh, uh, leaving it feeling old fashioned. Uh, it really speaks to a modern audience in, in a wonderful way. I've seen children from, I like to say, age four to, to 84 walk out of the theater and they're excited, they're tapping along, you know, with the songs and singing along. Something else that's interesting about this show as compared to other um, Broadway style shows is you have the, the safety of some shows where it's an all adult cast and everybody's trained. You're working with children, you're working with animals. Yes. What's that like? Well, the animals are more well trained than we are, so uh, <laughs> they're okay. Uh, they are, they're, they're performers in their own right and uh, the children are great. We have uh, uh, seven amazing kids working on this show uh, that are extremely talented with boundless energy and they, they are actually very helpful on the road as well because they're without their friends. They have uh, a parent that travels with them but their friends are back home. And you know, it's, and here it is, it's, it's been Thanksgiving week. And yeah. uh, we, by extension of that family, are not only helping them feel like their family's around them, but they're actually our family as well. Oh, very cool. A lot of good uh, relationships. And they're insanely talented. It's upsetting. It's genuinely upsetting how talented these kids are. People think of Daddy Warbucks, that he's kind of a money hungry, you know, fatherly figure. Um, can you relate to that character? He's a man who has determined he'll never be vulnerable or hurt in, a, in any kind of way again. And that kind of wall being built up does make him come across as very, uh, 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 he can be very stodgy at times, he can be very gregarious, but in a stentorian kind of way. Mm -hmm. What it ends up really being is he was a, a little boy that was hurt once and he promised himself he'd never be hurt again. The difficulty with that is you can never be vulnerable again. And when he meets Annie, all of that gets thrown out the window because she has all of his positive traits, that never giving up, that uh, constantly moving forward, that, uh, that optimism and hope and love, but she's kept it in a happier and a lighter and a, a more loving style. The real antagonist of the story is uh, hopelessness and love uh, being the true protagonist of the story, which is why hope, love, optimism are what Annie represents. You're right, story of hope. All right, well, look forward to seeing it this weekend, and good luck with the rest of the tour. Thank you so much. Gilgamesh Taggett in the studio with us today. Make sure you see Daddy Warbucks and the rest of the crew of Annie at the Walton Arts Center. Two more shows today, and then one more show that finishes up tomorrow on Sunday. Laura, we'll send it back to you. Everybody in this world is on some level yeah, an outsider. Get it, get it, yeah. Yeah. If you had to describe this show, how do you set it up? Um, Little House on the Prairie meets Mad Max. How do you tell people the plot of this? It's the hardest question. It's Paul Bunyan meets Mad Max. Maybe that's good. Yeah, because Paul Bunyan like dies like trying to, you know, outdo the, the the machine, right? I have no idea. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to see if he could chop the wood faster than the the machine. Yeah. Mine's like the long-winded spiel of you know a fictitious tribe of people that live on a mountain. They don't have money. They don't read, but they're a very mentally and physically tough people. Well, more years than we know, we have lived as we choose to live, free. I wanted to do something about some kind of alternative lifestyle or you know, off-the-grid community or gypsy clan or something like that. Um, 
And then I read an article about some different people living on top of a, a mountain somewhere. And then I saw a documentary about Appalachia. Some of the characters in Outsiders are really unlike anything we've seen on television before, which creates a unique challenge for the actors, some of whom have never taken on roles quite like this. I, I never seen. Seen what? One of y'all before. Who I'm for. Building Hassle is a lot of fun. He's a cool guy. It's a lot, a lot I like about that guy. <laughs> How did you prepare for these characters? A lot of it came, really came together once um, the whole cast got to Pittsburgh. Backgrounds. Background. I got an apartment out there, and um, I decided not to get internet, and I decided not to get a television, and um, it was very scary for the first week. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> because I had, you know, you have to detox from that stuff. Do you find that you have any particular personality traits that you can really compare to uh, and bring to the table with this character? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you, have, you have to do that, don't you? I mean, you have to find something that you personally relate to in this person that you're going to play. You think you could last a winter up there? How about 200? Sarlene is not too much different from who I am. Um, you know, girl, grew up in a small town, working class people. So more of my preparation came in learning about Kentucky and uh, dialect training. Making headlines across the nation, President Obama declared a federal emergency in Flint, Michigan over the weekend. This freed up $5 million in aid to provide safe drinking water to Flint residents. But local leaders say it isn't enough for a long-term solution to stop lead from leaching into water as it travels through the city's pipes. Here's Stephanie Parkinson with more. What we've got. There have been calls by Congressman Dan Kildee and now Mayor Karen Weaver for Governor Snyder to use some of the state's $570 million surplus to fix Flint's water pipes. The governor has said he is considering additional funding for the city. He's expected to address the water crisis tonight during his State of the State address. Topping national headlines, federal investigators now analyzing computers and other electronic devices as they try to figure out what led a married couple to kill 14 people and injure more than a dozen others at a holiday office party Wednesday? Chris Martinez has the latest from San Bernardino. A law enforcement source says the suspect's explosive devices are nearly a carbon copy of bomb constructing instructions provided in an Al-Qaeda magazine. And with the shooting making headlines everywhere right now, parents are struggling to explain the situation to their children. But as Marlissa Goldsmith reports, a teacher in Little Rock is tackling those tough questions one answer at a time. Let's talk politics now. Two weeks until the Iowa caucuses and the battle for the White House is intensifying. Campaigning in South Carolina yesterday, Hillary Clinton continued to present herself as President Obama's heir, while Bernie Sanders stuck to the issues at an event in Alabama. On the Republican side, Donald Trump courted evangelical voters in Virginia as top rival Ted Cruz accused him of not being a trustworthy conservative. In today's Money Watch, a day we thought we'd never see again. Gas prices under $1 per gallon in some places, and Uber is now taking to the skies. Here's Hannah Daniels. The storms we saw overnight moved in from Oklahoma. One area hit particularly hard, Chicota, just about 45 miles west of Salisaw. In fact, a rain-wrapped tornado was spotted. Troopers with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol say the tornado moved through Chicota around 845 last night, causing significant damage to homes and businesses. Debris is still scattered throughout the area, but the cleanup efforts are underway. And in the nearby town of Luther, a trooper with Oklahoma Highway Patrol had the roof ripped off his house. As you can see, the winds did quite a number on that house belonging to Tony Rumpel. He got some help from other law enforcement officers, plus neighbors working together to get everything cleaned up, and the trooper says he feels lucky the storm damage was not worse. Another possible rain-wrapped tornado caught on camera as it hit Mustang outside OKC yesterday. Take a look at your screen. You see power flashes. Then, just as the photographer zooms in, you can see the possible tornado. Tornado watches issued in 40 Oklahoma counties yesterday. And it wasn't just Arkansas and Oklahoma that got hit by those storms. Crews in Texas also dealing with the aftermath. Take a look at this video from how storms pounded that area with at least one tornado, strong winds in excess of 70 miles per hour, and heavy downpours. And this was the scene in Olathe, Kansas. Large hail dropping through parts of the area. No word on damage or injuries, but more storms are expected there today.